We're turning to the book, the book of Psalms, and Psalm number 12, please. Psalm number 12. The book of Psalms, and to the 12th chapter, please. And when you find the place, just leave your Bible open there, and let us unite our hearts again just for a brief prayer. And ask the Lord to minister to our hearts this morning. Father, we bow before Thee again, and we thank Thee, Father, for the Word of God that is before us. And we pray this morning that You will come by the power of Thy precious Holy Spirit, that You would come, Lord, and minister into all of our heart. And Father, we ask of Thee this morning that, that You would come down, Lord, over this congregation this morning. We pray for that angelic covering, Lord, that Thou would protect and guide us even today. And so, Father, we pray that You would just still us in Thy precious presence. And I give myself to Thee this morning. Give, Lord, all that I am and all that I have, praying that Thou will come and fill and cleanse and anoint and use and take this word this morning that you will be glorified. We ask it in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen. As one would go through the Word of God and study it and read it, it's amazing to see the different and the variety of people that the Lord uses. People from different walks of life. People with different backgrounds and different ages, even different colors of skin. People write throughout the word of the Lord that the Lord takes and he uses as a vessel in his hand. Men like Amos, the little herdsman from Dekoa, the young girl that was a widow by the name of Ruth, Joseph the carpenter, Nehemiah the cupbearer, Elisha the farmer. Of course, there's another man that is mightily used in the Word of God, and every one of us here this morning are very well acquainted with him. And that is the man by the name of David. In his early years, he was a shepherd. For some years, he was a servant of Saul in the palace. For many years, he was a soldier. In his later years, he was a sovereign. But throughout his years, he is described in 2 Samuel 23 as the sweet psalmist of Israel. Right throughout the life of David, he was this man that was known for penning psalms or songs unto the Lord. The psalms that David penned, there are over 73 psalms that he penned, but the psalms that he penned give us an insight into the heart of of this man of God, where David pulls away the exterior of his life, where he bears what's on his heart before the Lord. These psalms are times when we get into the very soul of this man, where we discover what's on his mind, where we discover what's on his heart. As you look through the Psalms of David, there's Psalms that you will discover something about the fears of David. And even while David was a mighty man of valor, and while he was a mighty man of God, there was fears in the heart of the Psalmist David. In Psalm number 18, he said, The floods of the ungodly, they made me afraid. The word there is the word to be terrified. It's the word to be petrified. Now, I don't know this morning who is here, but I'm sure there's a great number in this congregation this morning, and there's fear in your heart. Just like the man of God, Paul, that would come in the New Testament, he said himself, without were fightings, but within were fear. Away down in the throb of his heart, there was a fear there. Then, of course, in Psalm number 34, the psalmist David said, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me out of all my fears. And I was thinking during the week, I wonder what they were. 
Not just some of them, but all of them. Whenever you read the Psalms of David, you'll not only see his fears, but you'll discover something about his faith. In Psalm 70 or 37, he said, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Trust in the Lord. In verse 5, he said, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. That wonderful word, trust, is one of David's favorite words right throughout the book of Psalms. Is it any bit wonder that you read about him in the wonderful chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, here was a man, and there was fears in his heart, there was faith in his heart, but there is something else that you'll discover as you read the Psalms of David, and you'll discover something of the focus that he had in his heart. There was something that consumed David every day of his life. From the morning until the evening, he said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually upon my mouth. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come, let us exalt his name together. But I'm not after that this morning. Because as you go through the Psalms of David, you see his fears, you see his faith, you see his focus. But then you get to his feelings. You get into the feelings of this man of God. You remember whenever he penned Psalm 61, he said, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Psalm number 12 is a psalm where we discover the feelings of this man of God. And can I say this morning that while we don't walk by feelings, we walk by faith. Yet in all having said that, God is interested in how we feel. He knows how you feel this morning. The Word of God said, and Paul went on to pen, he said, we have an high priest who was touched with all the feelings of our infirmity. It's like the story of the little woman who went to her house of worship, and one of the deacons at the door said, you're looking well today, Maggie. And she muttered under her breath, she says, how I feel is not how, how I look. I wonder, is there someone here or many here this morning and how you look is not how you feel? And down in the throb of your heart, there, there may be fear there, but there's definitely some feeling there. And maybe even because of the circumstances in the days that have passed, you've maybe got many broken hearts here today. There's only three things I want to leave before you from this psalm this morning. The first thing is the title of the psalm. Look at Psalm number 12 and the title. It says, To the Chief Musician. Fifty-five psalms have that title. Fifty-five of the psalms are penned to the chief musician. And here in Psalm number 12, you get a little cluster of psalms that are penned to the chief musician. You'll get Psalm 11, Psalm 13, Psalm 14, in the middle of them, you'll get Psalm 12. Now that lets me know this morning the importance of the psalm. This psalm is not just to be played any old way. This song is not just to be sung with a half heart. This psalm and this song is to be watched over by the chief musician. In other words, it needs the touch of the Master's hand. And my dear believer, this morning, let me tell you this, as we and I journey through our life, the Word of God says that we are epistles, that we are open and we are read of all men. And we're living this morning not unto a chief musician, but we're living unto the chief shepherd, the bishop of our souls. And you know, my dear people, that would encourage our heart to remind us this morning 
that you and I just can't live whatever way we like. There's the importance of the psalm. Look at it again. To the chief musician upon Shem in Ith. Now that word, and you'll maybe find it in your margin, it'll have a little number beside it, and it'll have the number eight. Many scholars believe that this psalm was to be played upon this, the instrument of the eight strings. But there's one other commentator, and he was an old saint of God, and I like what he said. The number eight is where we get the, the, the word oct from, like octopus or octagon. It's the Latin word for eight. It's the word where you get in the, in the sphere of music the word octave. There's the octaves, there's the bars, there's the notes for the musician to play. And the old saint of God said this, that this psalm and this shimmeth means to be played on the deepest note of the octave. In other words, it comes from the depths of the heart. It's not a high note. It's a deep note. In fact, all of the other instruments would stop playing. All of the drums and the cymbals wouldn't play Psalm 12. Psalm 12 was played upon the instrument of the strings, and it came from the bowels of the psalms, the deep octave of his heart, deep down into the very soul of his being. There's only one other psalm that is played on the eighth octave like this, and it's Psalm number 6. Psalm number 6 is the first of the seven penitential psalms. It's the first of the psalms that David penned after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And in Psalm number 6, I can tell you what happens. David pours out from the depths of his heart. He plays on the eighth octave of his soul. Way deep down, my, as you and I would say this morning, he was bringing it from his very toe. You see the importance of the psalm. You see the instruction in the psalm. You see the identification of the psalm. Look at it again. To the chief musician upon Shimoneth, a psalm of David. Now, I don't know when this man penned this psalm. But all I know, there was a moment in this man's life whenever the feeling of his heart came from such a depth that he poured out his soul onto God. Some people think he penned it whenever he was a young servant in the, in the palace where he was ministering unto Saul. And it was there where Saul tried to, to nail him again and again to the wall. And David had a broken heart, I'm sure, there. Some people think it was whenever he was a fugitive away out in the hills of Judea and he was hunted as a partridge across the hills. Some people think it was whenever he was the king and his son Absalom turned against him and his fr best friend Ahithophel might turn to be his enemy. I don't know when David penned it, but there came a moment in David's life where he poured the, the eighth octave of his heart out onto God. And whether it was on a boulder in the hills of Judea, or whether it was in the side of the cave of Adullam, or whether it was beside his bed in the palace, or down before the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle that he had erected, here this man of God comes, and he bows his head, and he bends his knees, and he pours out his soul unto God. There's not only the title of the psalm, there's the theme of the psalm. Look at verse 1. This psalm is not only a song, but it's a prayer. This man starts to pray, and he prays a two-word prayer. Help, Lord. Coming from the eighth octave of his heart now. Coming on the deepest of the notes of his soul, and he gets into the place of the Lord and he cuts to the chase. He doesn't start to talk about the Lord and what the Lord has done. 
He doesn't start to quote many verses or start to tell the Lord what he's done that day. He cuts to the chase in his Christian experience and he says, Help, Lord! Help, Lord! Help, Lord! And has played upon the deepest note of his heart. That word help there is a word that expresses a need. If you were out for a walk at night and you heard someone cry, help, you know that that means that they need urgent assistance. This thing cannot wait. If someone was in a burning building, they wouldn't talk about the weather. They wouldn't talk about their job. But one word would be upon their lips. It would be, help me. Help me. And here the psalmist David, he gets alone with God. And he says, Lord, I need help. Help me, Lord. How often we use the same word in prayer. How often whenever we get up in the morning and we go into the closet and we get down beside the bed or we sit in the seat or we open the Word of God or we walk the field and from the, from the octave of our heart, my, there comes the word, help, Lord. Help me. And here David, he pours out his heart 38 times in the Psalms. He uses the word help. And maybe there's someone here this morning, let me tell you this. Maybe there's parents here this morning. And as you look at your children and as you look at your boy or you look at your daughter and you've done your best to bring them up on the things of God. And this morning they're as far from God as they've ever been. And they're involved in things this morning that you thought they would never be involved with. And there's times whenever you as a mother or a father get down and you bend your knees and you bow your head and with tears come out of your eyes, you say, help. Help, Lord. There's parental help. And then, of course, there's someone here maybe this morning and you know what it is to be bombarded in your mind by the enemy. And he comes with the fiery darts of accusation. He comes with the words of slander. He comes with the word there to accuse and to, to put you down and to defeat you. And maybe there's individuals here this morning and you would cry, Lord, help me in relation to your mental capacity. There's mental help. There's mental help. And then, of course, there's some of us here this morning and as we look at our spiritual life, and as we look at our progress and as we look at how often and how often we seem to stumble and how low we seem to get, whenever the fire goes out and our quiet times are dry and the Word of God is barren, there's times where we get alone and just the one word from the eighth octave of our heart, Help, Lord! Help me! And then, of course, there's those here today and they know all about the physical limitations of a body that's decaying. And the sickness is there. And the pains are there. The cancer might be there. The Parkinson's might be there. There may be arthritis there. And the things that you would love to do that you used to be able to do, you can't do them anymore. And there comes a moment in your heart where the, where the note of the eighth octave is played on your soul and you just say, help! Help me, Lord. And then, of course, there's marital help. Whenever the wife is at home on her own and her husband's running the country, and she's looking after the little family in the home. And her husband doesn't show her any affection the way that he used to. He's no longer interested in her the way that he used to be. And that, oh, that saint of God, that mother, as she looks at her husband and the first love seems to have been gone, she would get into the closet and say, Help, Lord! Help! Has that been the note of your heart? I tell you this morning, my dear people, thank God that he is a very present help in the time of trouble. Albert Barnes said this, whenever David prayed, help, Lord, 
He was in a situation where vain was the help of man. His situation was so dire. He was so low that men couldn't help him anymore. He needed God and God alone to help him. Help me, Lord. Of course, the first two letters of the word help is H-E. And thank God he can help. And he does help. Society is crying that word this morning. If you and I had ears to, to hear out in Dunungannon this morning, if you and I could hear the cries of society, we need help. We need help. If you and I could hear the cries of sinners this morning, men and women who at the end of their tether and they've drunk themselves into a stupor and they're waking up this morning on a Lord's Day morning while you and I are in the house of God. They would maybe say, oh, is there anyone can help me? David Wilkerson, that man of God, he said there was a young man that came to him who was hooked on heroin and he couldn't get off it. Ma, he tried doctors, he tried psychologists, he tried all that the world had to give. And one night he was lying in his bed at the end of his tether and he got his little syringe and drove the needle into his vein and drew the blood out of the vein in his arm. And as he lay in his bed, he, he squeezed the end of the syringe and he spelt on the ceiling above his little bed, H-E-L-P, help! Help me. I tell you, I think this morning there's some saints that are praying that prayer. You know, we'll get help this morning from the Lord because He is a very present help in the time of trouble, but we get help whenever you and I face the enemy. There's five kings in the, in the second book of Chronicles, and every one of them went against the enemy, and every one of them they cried unto the Lord for help. The first one was a man by the name of Asa. And Asa, he went against the Ethiopians in 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Of course, the Ethiopians are a picture of the powers of darkness. And you and I this morning are in a battle against the powers of darkness, against unseen spirits. And there came a moment in the battle, in the heat of the battle, whenever Asa was being surrounded by the enemy, where he seemed to be hedged in by the powers of darkness. The Bible said that Asa cried unto the Lord for help. And the Lord helped him. And then, of course, there was a man by the name of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, he was in the battle. He was against the Moabites and the Ammonites, and that's a picture of sexual sin. And whenever Jehoshaphat was surrounded by the enemy, the Bible says that Jehoshaphat cried unto the Lord in the battle, and the Lord helped him. And maybe there's a dear brother here this morning, and you know all about facing the enemy of sexual sin. Thank God there's help. Then there was a man by the name of Amaziah who went against the Edomites. Uzziah went against the Philistines. Hezekiah went against the Assyrians. Every one of them in the midst of the battle, they came to a place in their life where human help was of no value, human help was only vain, and they turned their eyes toward heaven like David in Psalm number 12 and said, Help, Lord. Lord, if you don't help me now, I'm finished. Lord, if you don't turn the situations over, and every one of them, they knew what it was, just like David here in Psalm 12. Look at verse 8, do you see? The wicked walk on every side. Here's a man that is hemmed in by the enemy now. Here's a man that is surrounded by his foes against the fiercest of the enemy, and he's surrounded on every side, and he cries, Help, Lord. Look at verse 5, For the oppression of the poor... For the sign of the needy, now will I arise. 
And thank God this morning, my dear people, if you're in a a battle this morning with the enemy and you've reached the end of your resources and you feel as if the the enemy is almost about to wipe you out, just like Asa, just like Jehoshaphat, just like Uzziah, you can cry unto the Lord in the heat of the battle and the God that delivered them will deliver you. It says of Uzziah that he was marvelously helped of the Lord. Of course, there's help whenever you and I face the enemy. Help from the Lord whenever we're cornered in. There's help from the Lord whenever we're at wit's end corner in relation to the family. You remember the Lord Jesus whenever he was in Matthew's gospel, chapter 15. And the Bible says there came a woman, she was a Syrophoenician by nature, a nation, And she came to the feet of the Lord, and that's what she prayed. She said, Oh Lord, help me. Her son or her daughter was demonically possessed. Psychologists couldn't help her. The nation had no solution for her, but she came to the feet of the Lord, and she said, Lord, if you don't help me, this thing's over. Lord, if you don't turn this situation, there's no hope, Lord. Lord, will you help me? And just in a moment, the Lord turned the whole situation. Then, of course, you'll remember whenever the Lord came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, he came down with with Peter, James, and John, and the disciples were gathered around. The Bible says, a father. And there, there was a father that had a son. And again, the enemy had just come in like a flood and he was demonly possessed and there he cast himself into the fire and into the water. The disciples couldn't help him. The doctors couldn't cure him. Society couldn't tame him. And he comes to the feet of the Lord and the one word that was on his heart was, Help us, Lord. And I wonder, was he reading Psalm number 12? And the Lord Jesus turned around to the Father. And this is what he said. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. And the father said, Lord, I believe. Help. Help thou my unbelief. Now here's a word to some of you parents here this morning. Some of you parents that never bother coming to the prayer meeting. The Lord would say over your children this morning, bring him or her to me, but you don't bring him. You're too busy. You're too busy with work and you're too busy making money. But I tell you, you know what this father did? At the end of his tether, there was no other answer. He brought his boy to the Lord and it was the Lord that turned the whole thing around. And I want to encourage you parents here this morning, don't wait till it's too late before you bring them to the Lord. Don't wait till it's beyond the point of help. Before you bring them to him, there's help in relation to the enemy. There's help in relation to the family. There's help this morning in relation to every difficulty. Whenever Paul was standing before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, with all of the trials that he went through and all of the beatings that he got, the perils of rivers, the perils of sea, the perils of robbers, the perils in the city, the perils of my own countrymen. He said to King Agrippa, he said, having obtained help from God, I continue on to this, this day. Thank God this morning you and I have got a throne a throne of grace that you and I can come to and we can come boldly to and there we can find grace to help, H-E-L-P, in the time of need. And I don't know, my dear people, what your need is today. I don't know what's even resonating in your heart as I'm speaking to you this morning. Maybe the Holy Spirit will be pinpointing some area of your life and deep down in your breast, you would say, Oh Lord, I would love you to give me help in that area of my Christian life. That there would be help from the Lord. After dear brother Trevor went into the presence of the Lord last year, I called around one day to see Sylvia and Glenn. And with a broken heart, 
she started to quote to me a verse from Psalm 41. In verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And I can tell you, my dear people, this morning, Sylvia is still living in that today. In Psalm 116, we read, I was brought low, but the Lord helped me. You remember in 1 Samuel chapter 7, whenever the nation was gathered together, and it was there where the Philistines came against the children of God, and they were in derision and in confusion. They didn't know what to do. The Bible says that Samuel, he brought a sucking lamb, and he raised an altar unto the Lord, and the Lord intervened, and they made a memorial unto the Lord, and they built a pillar of stone, and they called it Ebenezer. Hitherto has the Lord helped us. Hallelujah. And my dear believer this morning, let me tell you this. There's help. Never a trial that he is not there. Never a burden that he doth not bear. Never a sorrow that he doth not share. Moment by moment, I'm under his care. Never a heartache. And never a groan. Never a teardrop. Never even a moan. Never a danger, but there on the throne, moment by moment, he thinks of his own. Do you need help this morning? Parental help? Lord, would you show me what to do with my family? And the Lord would say, bring him, bring her to me. Let me do it. Is there someone here and you need marital help and there's division in the home and my, your spouse isn't as close as they used to be and the first love seems to be gone and you would say, Lord, help before it's too late. Maybe there's those and there's mental help and you're bombarded by the enemy in your mind. On and on we could go. Whatever your need is this morning, the Lord is a very present help in trouble. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her. And that right early. There's a title in the psalm. There's the theme of the psalm. Lastly, as we close, there's the tragedy of the psalm. Look at it again. Verse 1. Help. Help, Lord. I think he prayed that again and again. I don't just think he said it once. I think this man, David, he, he cried it again with repetitiveness on his lips. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. For the godly man ceaseth. There's not only the tragedy in the psalm. I tell you there's a tragedy in the church. This is happening this morning in the church. The godly man ceaseth. One of the old translations puts it like this. Help me, Lord, for the godly man is a thing of the past. And that's true today. The young man or young woman or the older believer this morning, I tell you, it's far and few between where you look at a saint of God and you say that individual's a godly individual. They're in touch with God. You hear it on the television almost all the time. They talk about extinction rebellion. And they're worried about the blackbirds. They're going to go extinct. They're worried about the, about the, the seagulls. They're going to go extinct. Or the little snail. All's going to be extinct. Well, I can tell you, my dear people, there's almost an extinction in the evangelical church this morning, and it is almost the extinction of the godly, not just the goodly. It says of Saul, the first king of Israel, that he was goodly. But you'll never read about Saul that he was godly. And I want to encourage and provoke your heart as I close this meeting this morning. 
Because I can tell you what my prayer is over the Lifeboat Fellowship and over my own life and over my own home, over my own wife and over my own children is God, would you make us godly? Make me godly. Make me godly, Lord. Now here's a wee bolt to some of you here this morning. There's some of us here this morning that if you and I were to be asked by our community or even by the Lord, maybe the answer would come back from heaven. You're busy. But you're not godly. Too busy to pray. Too, too busy with the sheep and too busy with the cows. Too busy with doing the plumbing and too busy with pulling wires. Too busy under the bonnet of a car. Too busy walking the field. Too busy watching television. Oh, they're busy, they're busy, but they're not godly. My dear believer this morning, don't you be too busy to be in the prayer meeting. Because if you're too busy, your children will know it. And they'll say, oh, my father's a busy man. But I don't think I could say of my father that he's a godly man. And then, of course, the world might say and the family might say, oh, he's a wealthy man. He's got plenty of gold. He's got the best cattle in the county. He's got a big car and he's got a big house. He's a very wealthy man. That, But, oh, I wonder what they have to say. I wonder, could I say that he's godly? And then, of course, we could be worldly. We could be moody. And on and on we could go. But oh, I can tell you, my dear believer, this morning, the one thing that the Lord is looking for as he would look out over the battlements of heaven is that his people would be godly. I'm sure you've been in the company of someone that is godly. And you say, my, there's something different about that person. There's something different. There's a different atmosphere when you go into that home. There's something different whenever you talk to them. There's something different when they pray. There seems to be a nearness of God that comes with them. Men and women that are godly. And it was the psalm of David in Psalm 4. He said, the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. What does it mean to be godly? Fifteen times in the New Testament, we read about the word godly and godliness. Ten times out of those fifteen times, Paul used it when he was writing to young Timothy. And he was writing to young Timothy, the minister of the word at Ephesus, and again and again, ten times, godliness, 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 godliness. Why did he do that? Because Paul knew that if Timothy could get a grasp of it and he could filter it into his congregation, he would have a, a congregation of people that were godly. Not just busy. Not just worldly. Not even just funny. But godly. Men and women that are, are godly. I'll tell you what godliness is. It's godlikeness. Christ-likeness. You'll remember in Genesis chapter 2, and this is something for you to think about. In Genesis chapter 2, it was there where God made man. He made Adam of the dust of the ground. He made him in his own image and in his own likeness. And then Adam sinned and Eve were put out of the Garden of Eden. But in Genesis chapter 5, we read that Adam begot a son in his own likeness and after his own image. And that's the fallen image. That's the image that is distorted. That is the image that is marked by sin. That is the image that is a bent against God. But in Romans chapter 8, after the, the precious blood has been shed, and after the, the work of the cross has been finished, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, for whom he did for no, them he did predestinate, to be conformed to the image of His Son. 
You remember in Acts chapter 4, four chapters after the Lord Jesus ascended to heaven, the Bible says that the world took knowledge of the disciples that they had been with Jesus. And that's why at Antioch they were called Christians. It was a derogatory term to be called a Christian. If you were called a Christian, what it really meant that you're like the Christ that died on the cross. There was a godliness, there was a Christ-likeness, there was something that resembled the Master about their life. And that's what Paul said to the believers at Corinth. He said that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. You know all the times that godly is mentioned in the Old Testament? One of the translations of it is the word kindness. I'll tell you, my dear people, Godliness is godlikeness, but it's also kindness. I tell you, there's no one as kind as the Master Himself. There's no one as tender and no one as gentle as He Himself. Holiness is something God does in the heart. Godliness is what the saints work out in their hands. Andrew Murray, that old saint of God that lived in South Africa, who penned many books in prayer, but whenever Andrew Murray used to turn a corner and walk the streets of, of Cape Town or Johannesburg, whenever he turned the corner, everybody stopped. Stopped talking. They stopped walking. And they would watch the man of God as he would go down, down the road. He was godly. Do you remember the man, of, man that was called Voltaire? Voltaire was that... He, he was that atheist that was against God and against the Bible. And, he, and that old atheist, Voltaire, on one occasion was asked, did you ever see anybody that was like God? And he was an atheist. Did you ever see anybody that was like the Christ of the Bible? And Voltaire, in a flash, he says, yes, I have. He was John Fletcher, the vicar of Medley. He says, every time I see him, I think that I'm looking at the Savior. He was godly. My dear believer, this morning, if you leave this meeting and the prayer of your heart would be to the day that you die, oh, make me godly. I've accomplished my task this morning. Oh, I don't want to be worldly. I don't want to be funny. I don't want to be too busy. But oh, make me a godly wife. Make me a godly husband. Make me a godly deacon. Make me a godly elder. Make me a godly man and woman of God. Oh, that my people, that the, the children will be able to say, oh, she's godly. Godly. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, it says in the last days, there'll be those that have a form of godliness. The word is a, a shell. The outline of it, but there's no substance to it. It's just like a formula. The word is a formula. When someone is making pancakes, they'll put the egg and they'll put the buttermilk and they'll put the sugar and they'll have the formula and then comes out the pancake. And there's so many in the last days, they, they put a little bit of church and they put a little bit of Bible reading, they put the right thing on, their, on, on clothes, clothes and different areas of their life, and they say, oh, this will be the formula for godliness. But oh, my dear people, to be godly is to be like God, to have the characteristics of the Savior Himself. And as I close, I'll give you some things this morning, and I'll just fire them out to you as a close. To be godly, you will need to be soaked in the Word of God. To be godly, you will need to be sustained by the power of God. To be godly, you will need to be submissive to the Spirit of God. To be godly, you will need to stay close to the side of God. To be godly, you will need to supplicate the throne of God. O oh Lord, make me godly. There is a man... In India, he was saved. His name was Sadhu Sundar Singh. And Sadhu Sundar Singh, he was called the apostle of the bleeding feet. He walked 40 times in his bare feet over the hills of the Himalayas into the country of Tibet. There was a time in 
whenever he was surrounded by a city in Tibet and they put him down into a cave and down into an old dry well and there was rats, there was rats there and the rats came out to get him. And he said that he, suddenly the, 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 the door of the well opened and there was a rope came down and Sadhu Sundar Singh, he put his hand on the rope and there was this power that just pulled him up, not jerk at a time, but just a steady pull upwards and as he got to the top of the well, he says there wasn't a man there. God brought him out of the well. He went on a tour of America and England and he stood at the door of George Truett. George Truett was a wonderful Baptist preacher. And he knocked George through its door at the front door of his house and the little maid came to the door and opened the door. And there Sadhu Sundar Singh stood with his Indian robe and the, the turbine upon his head. And he said, I'm here, I want to, I want to see Dr. Truett. And the little girl said, I'm sorry, sir, but Dr. Truett's in the study. You can't see him today. But he said, I must see him. I'm going back to India tomorrow. I must see the man of God. And so the little maid, she left him at the door and she went up the stairs and she knocked in the study of Dr. Truett. And he said, yes, dear, what is it? He says, it must be very important because you're disturbing me whenever I'm seeking God. She said, sir, there's a man at the door that wants to see you. Who is it? Oh, sir, I couldn't repeat his name. I had never heard his name before. But I think Jesus is standing at the front door. I think it's Jesus standing at the door. Godly. Godly. Or just busy. Or just wealthy. Or maybe just funny. But I wonder this morning, are we godly? And here this man of God, he prays, Help, Lord. Help. Help, Lord, for the godly man. Cecil. The great extinction in the church today. There's so many of us are goodly. But oh, would to God, every one of us would be godly. Godly. Let us pray. Father, we bow before thee this morning. And Lord, that is the prayer of our heart over this congregation, over this preacher. O oh, gracious God, we pray that you'll make us like the Master. Pray that you'll make us godly. Lord, in these last closing days of time that we would be marked by a godliness and a graciousness and a kindness. Lord, we pray this morning when all around us is darkness and deception. We pray even down here by the hill, the river, and the valley. We pray, and not only here, Lord, but across the acres of Ireland, we ask that you'd raise a band of men and women whose hearts God has touched. That we would be men and women that would walk in the footsteps of the Master. That we would be individuals, as Paul could say, that the life also of Jesus is made manifest in our mortal flesh. And so, Father, whatever you've communicated to our heart this morning, those that need help in the situations of life, we pray that you would draw graciously near, Lord, and even as you responded to the psalmist David in Psalm 12 and verse 5, now will I arise. We pray for those today that need an intervention. We ask that you'll arise and break through. Oh, we ask this morning, that you would make every one of us here today, parents, children, from the oldest to the youngest, men and women of God. We ask it in the Savior's name. Amen. We're going